So the patriarchy, the system of power that privileges men, is clearly present in A Midsummer's Night's Dream. Like, the play starts with a man, Theseus, announcing his marriage to an Amazonian warrior, thus subordinating a strong woman within the restrictions of that union. Shortly after that, Aegeus attempts to give away his daughter, a father trying to use his position as a man to control his daughter's future. She doesn't want to marry the man her father has picked out for her, but that doesn't stop him from treating her as though she were an object, or, as Theseus puts it, a form in wax which a father can figure or disfigure at his will. Hermia, his daughter, is, in other words, treated as his property, something he can mold. And that is only what happens in Act 1. At the start of Act 2, we see the king of the fairies, Oberon, desire to take an Indian boy from Tatiana, his queen, thus removing that child from the maternal care that she provides and promoting him to service as a knight under male leadership. So the patriarchy is present in the first two acts, but it's worth noting that it hasn't been fully successful. At the start of Act 4, Theseus is not yet married, Hermia, the daughter of Aegeus, has escaped into the woods with her lover, and Oberon has not yet severed the relationship between the boy and Tatiana. By the end of Act 4, these issues will be resolved, and it will seem like patriarchy will get all the victories that it desires. But obviously, this being Shakespeare, the answers are never that clear. This will be the focus of today's analysis. If reading Shakespeare like this seems like your kind of thing, then please consider subscribing for more like this. But now let's just get on to examining the methods and impacts of patriarchy in Act 4, play by play. Act 4 starts with Bottom treated as a prince. He has fairies doing all sorts of chores for him. This guy, a weaver, an over-eager actor who in Act 1 wants to play every character, has, in some ways, been validated here. He saw himself as great, as somebody who could play both male and female leads and a lion at the same time. He has, in this play, been a blue-collar worker, an aspiring actor, a donkey and a man at the same time, and a concubine to the Queen of Fairies. In this scene, he is playing the tyrant just as he told us he would in Act 1. Personally, I think that he's able to play all of these parts so well because he's not actually playing them. He is always Bottom, and Bottom has such an uncompromising sense of his own worth that he's going to give dignity to whatever role he's in. After witnessing Bottom in all his glory, we learn that the central driving action of the entire play, the conflict between Oberon and Tatiana and their argument over the future of the Indian boy, it's been resolved offstage. We don't even get to see it. We only know because Oberon tells Puck about it. He tells Puck about how he shamed Tatiana for her affair with Bottom. He says, I did abrade her and fall out with her, for she his hairy temples then had rounded with a coronet of fresh and flagrant flowers. He then continues to inform Puck that his harassment led to her, in mild terms, begging his patience. So, in short, she has mixed her maternal caregiver energy with her feminine sexuality and oriented it in the direction of a donkey-headed human. For that, Oberon mocked her until she became submissive. Then, he uses his position of power to sever her maternal caregiver bond with the Indian boy, and he incorporates that child into the world of men, where he can become a henchman or a knight. That's a decisive victory for patriarchy. And now that this conflict in the unseen world of the fairies has been resolved, the other conflicts can find a resolution as well. Oberon undoes the effects of the love potion on Tatiana, and Puck returns Bottom to his original physicality. When the fairies exit, Theseus and Hippolyta enter with Aegeus and other fancy people. Theseus is ready for a hunt, and he wants to show off how cool he is by having Hippolyta listen to the sounds of his dogs hunting. Hippolyta responds by saying, Actually, I was with Hercules and Cadmus once, when in a wood of Crete they bade the bear with hounds of Sparta. Never did I hear such a gallant chiding. And not to be outdone by the likes of Hercules and Cadmus, Theseus says, My dogs are from Sparta too. He says, my hounds are bred out of the Spartan kind. A cry more tunable was never hollowed, nor cheered with horn in Crete, in Sparta, nor in Thessaly. And, I mean, poor Theseus. Hippolyta has seen more impressive dogs than his. His fragile ego was in danger of being hurt there. He was getting a little pouty. 
But luckily, he's saved when they all come across the sleeping youth. When they awake Lysander, he explains the original plan to Theseus, that he and Hermia intended to run away. Aegeus is upset and confides in Demetrius that this plan would have defeated them, defeated you of your wife and me of my consent, of my consent that she should be your wife. In other words, Hermia's disobedience threatened the control that men have over her. Good thing that didn't happen. But this isn't a win for Aegeus. Demetrius steps up and says that his love for Hermia was like an illness, but he's well again, and now only wants Helena. So Aegeus wanted to treat his daughter like an object or a gift that could be given away, and that doesn't happen, and maybe we can view that as an L for the patriarchy, but not really. So Demetrius will marry Helena, not Hermia. But that's not actually at this point because Helena wants it to happen. She actually was prepared to walk away in the last act. It's because Demetrius wants it to happen. The will of Aegeus ultimately is undone by Demetrius, not Hermia. A man can violate the trust of another man, but it is clearly not the case that a woman can violate the trust of a man. Moreover, this scene, Act 4, Scene 1, will be the last time Hermia or Helena speak in this entire play. Their childhood friendship, their supportive female friendship from their youth, has been thoroughly severed in the previous night when they mocked and threatened each other. With their upcoming marriages, they have entered into the world of marriage, men, and adulthood. The women are silenced and the men will speak for them from this point on. The hierarchies have been restored. Every Jack has his Jill. Bottom concludes the scene when, upon waking, he cannot articulate what has just happened to him. He says, the eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen, man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. And many commenters have noted that this is remarkably similar to a passage from the Bible. 1 Corinthians verse 9 says, As it is written, eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Obviously, Bottom's version is comic, as he's saying that the eye cannot hear. He's mixing up words, just as he has the entire play, but he's also calling attention to that tension between imagination and perceptual physical reality that has run through the entire play, and that I discussed in detail in my Act 3 analysis. Corinthians says that we're not able to perceive with our senses the things God hath prepared, and this is true in the play, only it's the fairy world which has been unseen by everybody except for Bottom. People don't understand the world just through their senses. And we can use that framework to re-examine why Hermia prefers Lysander, or why Demetrius prefers Helena, even though everybody is equally beautiful. Their preferences, their love, is more indebted to divine sight or imagination than to any sensual, perceptual, physical reality. And that theme of perceptual reality blending with our imagination is what theater is all about. And scene two returns to the theater. Peter Quince and his friends discuss how their show simply cannot go on without bottom. It is not possible, he says. You have not a man in all of Athens able to discharge Pyramus but he. In the course of this play, we have seen how literally everybody is replaceable. Demetrius and Lysander are basically the same person. The will of Demetrius replaces the will of Aegeus. The authority of the father, Aegeus, is replaced by the authority of the duke, Theseus. The partnership Hermia once had with Helena, she now has with Lysander. We're all interchangeable and replaceable. Anyone can be substituted for another. But not Bottom. Among his friends, Bottom is irreplaceable. I don't really know what to make of that, but it makes me like Peter Quince. It makes me think that the theater group is at least good about caring for each other better than all the other communities represented in this play. When Bottom returns, they erupt in joy, and he's eager to tell them his story and to start preparing for the, quote, comedy that they hope to perform at the wedding. But that'll happen in Act 5, which I'll discuss in the next video, play-by-play. Play. Subscribe to be notified of its release, and thank you for watching.